Welcome back to Earth Sky. The Vera C. Rubin Observatory in Chile achieved first light on June 23rd. Next up, a conversation with Earth Sky's David Dalian and astronomer Eric Bellum about what this telescope is expected to reveal. Tell us who you are and what you do in terms of the Vera Rubin and what its primary mission, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. Tell us all about that. It's fascinating stuff. Great. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Eric Bellum. I'm a professor at the University of Washington, and I'm also the alert production science lead for the NSF DOE Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which you see here uh, in the picture. Uh, so Rubin is a new telescope, a new observatory located on the mountaintop down in Chile in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, it has an enormous new uh, eight meter telescope, an enormous digital camera, uh, and it's going to survey the night sky for 10 years in the with its legacy survey of space and time, or LSST. So this is a, a, a really wonderful uh, multicolor image uh, and movie of the night sky uh, that we're going to be taking uh, starting almost immediately this year. Uh, and, and it's going to last for 10 years and give us hundreds of images across the whole southern sky. You know what? I feel like we need to see one of those images, and I've got a beautiful image of the Triffidon Lagoon Nebula that the Rubin acquired when it was taking first light. Have we ever seen this much detail of this object before, Eric? Uh, it's a it's a gorgeous image. It's really exciting. Uh, you know, uh, the Rubin is giving us such a it's got this really unique wide field. So you can see about 45 full moons in a single picture. And again, six, six different uh, color filters, which allows us to sort of zoom in on that detail. So it it's uh, really giving us this unprecedented sort of uh, like wide view of the southern sky. And uh, the survey speed is where it, it really shines and able to to capture large, large portions of the cosmos uh, in a hurry. The whole, the whole southern sky every that's right seventy two hours. That's right, that's, a, that's and your job. You said you were the alerts manager. That means you're going to be getting all of the alerts if we found something. Yeah, the, the the team that I work with is responsible for taking those images that come back from the telescope and very rapidly finding all the things that are moving and changing them and sending out alerts to uh, scientists around the world to follow up. Okay, so that makes me wonder, what are we going to find? Let's yeah. talk about that. And let's, why don't we start close to home? I sure, know we're going to be finding a whole lot of, of these guys. Here's an exactly. asteroid. Yeah, so, so Ruben is going to find tons and tons of solar system objects, you know, as many as 10 times various, uh, various families. So uh, asteroids, uh, like you see here, uh, both in the main belt, Jupiter Trojans, comets, uh, it'll, we're expecting to find lots of trans-Neptunian objects, so sort of icy bodies in the distant solar system. Uh, Those are and, things that are out beyond the orbit of Neptune, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And maybe even potentially, you know, the hypothesized Planet Nine. Uh, if that exists, uh, Rubin is very well positioned to find it. This is going to be probably what catches everybody's attention most. If, it, if it's out there, uh, Mike, Mike Brown from Caltech, assures me it is there. His math says it's got to be. This is Planet Nine. Will we find Planet Nine? I, I think it's an open question, and we're really excited to find out the answer. Uh, <laughs> certainly, Ruben has the sensitivity. Uh, all the sort of models that I've seen suggest that, you know, if it is in the southern hemisphere sky where Ruben, Ruben can take images, uh, Ruben will find it. And Mike actually uh, told us that this is the perfect instrument for finding these kinds of things. Can we talk just a second about how it how it works? What is it actually doing? Yeah, so uh, it's it's at heart, uh, you know, a digital camera, not that different from the one on, on your cell phone, but uh, just at a uh, much, much larger scale, right? It's about the, the, the digital camera is uh, 3.2 gigapixels, and it's the size of a small car. Uh, so it's the largest <laughs> digital camera ever built. Uh, but basically, uh, we, we point it uh, at the night sky using the telescope and take a picture every 30 seconds. And we get uh, the image from that and, you know, rapidly process it, try to find, uh, you know, calibrate it, remove any signatures from the, from the instrument, 
uh, and then look for things that are are moving uh, or you know for for solar system objects specifically um, you know we compare uh, the new image we just took to a stack of previous images uh, uh, at that position of the sky and we can see things that have changed in brightness we can think, see things that have moved and then we feed those to sophisticated algorithms to try to find uh, uh -huh. find orbits here is a a close-up a sample of the Virgo cluster taken by by the Rubin Observatory. Are all of those galaxies? Most of them are actually, yes. Even some of the faint dotty ones are very distant galaxies. Uh, obviously you can see some of the more nearby ones. We can see their spiral or elliptical structures. And in the top right, you see some interactions from past mergers, uh, but there are also stars intermixed in. This is an extra galactic field. So we're looking sort of out of our galaxy, but we are certainly seeing some subset of stars along that line of sight as well. So yeah, Rubin can see uh, all the way out into the distant halo of our own galaxy, individual stars, and then distant galaxies as well. Wow. I suppose we're going to be finding exotic objects out there. I have an example of one of those. Here's a couple of white dwarves getting ready to collide maybe. Of course, and obviously, again, an artist's rendition. We don't actually have a snapshot of this. Will we be finding these kinds of events before they happen or when they happen? What What are we going to find? Tell us, yeah, please. So, so the, the fact that we're making this movie of the night sky means that we're getting, again, hundreds and hundreds, nearly a thousand images uh, of each position in the night sky. And so you can see that sort of time variability. And so, you know, in the, in the, in the case of, you know, white dwarf binaries like this one, uh, as they orbit, you will see uh, modulation of the of, of the brightness because you're seeing you know this distorted teardrop shape creates sort of a change in area as it rotates. There are different brightness and temperature effects, and so you can search for those sort of periodic variations, which you know the some of the shortest um, you know some of the uh, closest uh, double white dwarf binaries that we know of today have periods of uh, you know four or five minutes. So they're extremely tight orbits. Uh, and so uh, certainly Rubin will be well positioned to find exotic variables and binaries such as this one. Okay, and here's another Nova image. Exactly, so, so this is cases of uh, accretion. So you, you have material being pulled off a companion star uh, onto a, a, a compact object. And so these often will, as you sort of allude, have transient outbursts that uh, can be again observed in in time over time uh, by Rubin. And so the depth and temporal sampling are really advantages here for Rubin to be able to discover these. That's astounding. I imagine that the the Rubin the instrument itself must be incredibly robust. I mean, you you said that the camera it's the size of a small car, but this yep. thing has got to be whipping around to get. That's Tell right. us about the, the engineering on that. I, yeah, so, so, so the, the telescope was purpose-built from the beginning for speed because the faster you can survey, the more you can discover. Uh, and so the telescope itself, which is, you know, again, an eight meter mirror, uh, you know, slews incredibly quickly because it's taking a 30 second exposure and then in just two or three seconds, it wants to be on the next field over. And so uh, it's, I, I have been fortunate to see it in person and it's an incredible piece of engineering and it's really exciting to see it, uh, you know, whipping around the sky. Yeah, speaking of exciting things, let's take another look at this image, this deep sky, the Virgo cluster again. Now we know that something is holding those galaxies, those spirals together besides the mass that we can detect. There's a lot of dark matter and dark energy can this tell us something about all that stuff? Absolutely. So the cosmologists are, are extremely excited for the Rubin data. Uh, much of that is going to be uh, coming from the deep co-added stacks of images. So you get the, the greatest amount of depth and can see the furthest back in time. Uh, and so some of the things that they hope to do uh, is uh, you can uh, sort of measure uh, the effects of dark matter on uh, the shapes of galaxies. There are these subtle distortions that happen uh, as the matter is distributed over space and time. And so they do these enormous sort of statistical measurements over the entire night sky in very sophisticated ways to try to, to trace that impact. And then in terms of dark energy, uh, things like uh, supernova 1A, which are uh, you know exploding white dwarfs, they're standard candles. So we know uh, how bright they are 
uh, and thus how far away they are. Uh, Rubin's, again, time domain survey will let us find those out to great distances and we'll have them uh, extremely well calibrated and be able to use those for uh, you know, Hubble diagrams and the sorts of analysis that enabled the initial discovery of uh, the accelerating universe. That's fascinating. We had Wendy Friedman on uh, not too long ago, and she told us about the stuff she's been able to find with the James Webb Space Telescope. Yes. I imagine she is chomping at the bit to see the, the Vera Rubin Observatory data. Indeed. Wow. Wow, wow. Eric, thank you so much for being here. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Thank you.